Uh, I was fortunate enough to meet uh, our guest uh, a few years ago at the memorial service of uh, a mutual friend, a wonderful actor producer named Tommy Williams. Um, I said, uh, do you mind if I get a photo with you? And she said, do I look all right? And I said, you look beautiful. I look like crap, you look beautiful. <laughs> uh, her resume rivals Mickey Rooney. She started entertaining as a toddler. By 11, she was a professional radio actress and appeared on thousands of broadcasts. She is, to the best of my knowledge, the last surviving actor to have been directed by both Orson Welles and Alfred Hitchcock. She worked with Harold Lloyd. And uh, she uh, also appeared in that infamous classic, actually she starred in it, The Screaming Skull. Yeah. The, uh, there was a skull, but it didn't scream. It didn't get on the screen. So did much of the audience. Anyway, um, it is an absolute thrill to have her here, especially as uh, her birthday is next week. She's a fellow Virgo. I won't tell you how old she is. But um, let's put it this way. When she first came here, it was called the Newtown Music Hall. <laughs> All right, I'll take you out one at a time. Uh, it is an honor and a privilege to spend some more time with her. Would you please welcome to the stage, are we good? On time? Okay. The wondrous Miss Peggy Weber. Oh, now it's on. <laughs> and as a radio actress, you should be familiar with uh, my <laughs> um, You started, uh, as I said, uh, as a toddler in theaters, and then at 11, you became a professional, at 11, you became a professional radio actress. How does it work from Laredo, Texas, and up on radio at 11? Well, I have, I have to say that I was born in Texas, Laredo, and my father was an oil man. He had four, 400 oil wells pumping in Breckenridge in Dallas when the crash came, when we, we went into a depression. And at two, my mother had put me in dancing school. At two and a half, the theater company came through the radio, and they were looking for talent from dancing schools, I guess. And so they saw me, and they put me in their show. And I went on stage singing and dancing at two and a half between films, and the next day after my performance, the Laredo newspaper said, a new star is born. <laughs> and they said it was my name. So from then on, I felt that I owed something, that I should learn about it. And give something back. And so that was my beginning. By the time I was 11, I was writing and directing. But I'd like to preface that with saying that I was home alone when I was about 10 and a half and heard a wonderful voice on the radio coming from New York. We were living in San Antonio at the time, and I was alone, and I was so mesmerized with the work that I was hearing that I made up my mind then and there that was what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. And it was Orson Welles, and he was presenting first a story of Abraham Lincoln, and then a story of my little boy. Both of them were so moving that I never forgot it. And because the world was coming apart for me as a young person, with Germany and Italy and all the terrible things that we were seeing in the Cafe News, 
Incidentally, I forgot to tell you, my father's oil business went to pieces about a year after I was born. And so he decided to go to the gold mines in California, where he owned a gold mine. That didn't work out, but I was in California, and I was learning as much as I could about theater, because I felt that with the world being so frayed, we needed people who were telling stories, and stories that were healthy, stories that gave young people ambition, <coughs> stories that we're not doing as much of today as we should. And that kept me going right on through my years after my father died when I was 15. I graduated from high school in Tucson, Arizona, took the train with the money that we got from selling the old car. My mother and I had to sit on suitcases because it was wartime and soldiers were assigned all of the steps, all of the seats. So we had to sit out on the back, what did they call that little back part you know, of the train? Uh, and both of us looked at each other and said, what, what are we going to do when we get to California? And I said, I'm going to the radio station and see if I can get a job. <laughs> That's how it all started. Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, you eventually ended up working with Orson Welles in radio I and did. in films. I did. Oh, I got the most important part of the story. <laughs> when my father went to Arizona for his gold mine. We lived in the desert and we had no indoor plumbing. And the only time I could listen to radio was in the car out of the desert where the coyotes were howling all around me. <laughs> and my father would shout, Don't run down the batteries! <laughs> listening to Orson Welles. Once a week, this show was on the air, and I devoured every bit of that show. I, I knew every person who was on it. I knew the musicians, everything about it, and how Orson handled it was my ideal, and I kept, I kept that with me. So, tell us how you ended up working with Orson. I, I, I began doing radio the first, the first day that I came to Hollywood. I went into the CBS lobby where a young red-haired man was wearing a uniform and he was answering questions. And I said to him, how do I apply for a job? I've just come from Tucson, Arizona, where I had my own radio show, and I would like to speak to someone. He, he looked at me, kind of laughed, and said, well, I think the best thing you can do is fill out a form. And then, since you've been an actress, and since you had your own show, you better put down that you're open for auditions. And I said, well, thank you very much. That young man was the person who wrote the I Love Lucy shows from the very beginning. And he wrote the radio version, and he wrote the television version. And his name was Bob Carroll, and his daughter has become my lifelong friend. So anyway, 
that's how I got my first radio job, was through this young red-haired fellow who called a, a number that I'd given him. There was a, a phone in the hall of an apartment house, and I found an apartment for my mother and me for something like $27 a month. That's how much one could pay at that time. That was 1942. And the phone rang. I ran out picked up the receiver, and it was this young fellow, Bob Carroll, saying, where are you? Get over here. I put your name in for an audition. And I said, oh, I'll be right there. So I, I ran downstairs and ran two or three blocks and got in the front door. And on my way running over, I thought, I'd better try to have an audition in my head because I don't have one. So I'll do impersonations of all the movie stars. That was something I used to do in school to entertain the children. And so I, I did that. But they pushed me in the room and I said, do you, do you want me to read your material? They said, no, you do yours. And I did it. And it was for, for David O. Selznick's director, who was directing commercials that had Ingrid Bergman on them, because she was working for Selznick, and she was in Switzerland or Norway or somewhere. And so they needed someone who could do an impersonation of her. <laughs> well, I got the job. <laughs> and I began, oh, I forgot to say, Edna Best and uh, Helen Mack and uh, Mercedes McCambridge were oh, wow. in the booth with the young director, Ted Wick, who worked for Selznick, and they all came out laughing, and they, they hugged me and kissed me, and they said, you're going to be great at radio. You're going to be, and I was just dumbfounded. I thought, this is my first day in radio. And, and all these wonderful people at the best promised me that she would put me on Sherlock Holmes, and uh, Helen Mack that she would put me in her shows. She had two or three comedy shows. And Mercedes Ms. McCambridge came over and kissed me on the cheek, and she said, you're going to be wonderful. I can't tell you what a great memory that is. <laughs> So, you still haven't told us how you hooked up with Orson Welles. <laughs> I was so, out of, out of that first job, I, got, I started getting 21 shows a week. That was fantastic. I, I, I was auditioning for Casablanca, and that show, I won the Ingrid Bergman role, and 40 of the top radio actresses and other actresses were auditioning for the part, and it ran for 30, 30 episodes on CBS. Well, Orson caught some of those. He, he heard some of those, and also I had Time, Time Magazine gave me a lovely writer, and I didn't know how important it was, but I had a feeling that it was going to change my life. And I was working for soap operas every morning through the afternoon, and then I worked evening shows. And when I was working my soap opera at 8 o'clock, no, it was, it was the later one, it was it was one that ended about two o'clock in the afternoon. So I was going on my getting ready, and I was playing a horrible woman. I'd been playing her for nine 
for she did I did play her for nine years, but at that point I'd just been playing it for about a year. And the man at the booth pressed the button. They said, you've got a telephone call. And I said, with the red lights going on in a minute, and I'm playing this difficult show all by myself. Because I was playing a murderess, I was playing somebody who was in prison, who was pregnant, having a baby. <laughs> <laughs> And I said, I can't answer the phone now. He said, it's Orson Welles. Oh my God. And I said, yes, <laughs> and I said, yes, Mr. Wells. And he said, Peggy, get over here. And I said, I, I, I'm going on the air and the red light's going on. He said, well, as soon as it goes off, run right over here. <laughs> I, I did that. <laughs> and I ran as fast as I could, and when I got to CBS, which was about six blocks away, I saw everybody with champagne glasses, and I thought, what is he calling me? I, you know, I was, I was only 18 years old or something. I thought, what, what is he calling me to come drink champagne? But it wasn't that. He came out of the booth, and he said, I want you to play a Russian accent, and you're the love interest opposite me. Oh, <laughs> 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 and I would go thumbing through it as madly as I could to figure out what the story was about. I didn't know the show was going to go on right away. They thought he was just waiting outside. They were letting them in, and we were going to go live on the air. And, it was, it, Orson came out of the booth and dropped his script all over the floor. Everybody in the audience went crazy. They were screaming and hollering, and all of the actors got down on their hands and knees and put the script back together. And he pulls another script out of his pocket and said, Don't bother. <laughs> so we went on the air, and I then had to wait about a year or so, and I heard from Orson again. And he said, I want you to come and audition for. Lady Macduff, I'm doing Macbeth. And so I, I said, you know, I had to do a couple of shows before I could come over. And he said, that's all right, we'll wait for you. So when I got to Republic Studio, where he was working on a bet that he had with Mr. Yates, who ran Republic, he, uh, he was up in the projection room wearing his Mexican, what is that shirt that Mexican men wear? Poncho. It's the Bruce Heidi shirt. Poncho? Poncho? No. Serape? No. Sure. A special summer shirt. <laughs> so, so he had me read it. And he said, that's it. Go downstairs, you got the part. And he said, also, you're playing the witches. And I said, oh, thank you. <laughs> I went downstairs, and Jeanette Nolan, Elliot Reed, um, two or three others, Paul Stewart, the circle that was Orson's circle were recording and he told me to record my part. He wanted me to record Lady Macduff and the witches. So that's what I did. And I came back for two or three or four or five or six or seven more times to work on that. And then they began filming it, and we had to act to the song that was coming over the speaker. He was not recording us 
live. He was playing back what we'd recorded, and we had to look like we were mouthing it. That was very difficult, because a real actor wants to feel what they're doing, and you have to match a voice at the same time and look like you're not straining. It's not easy. <coughs> but that's the way the first draft of Macbeth was made. And Jeanette Nolan and Brady Doppio and I were the witches. And now they're selling the pictures of the witches as the people who played the parts. We played the parts. He later posed the witches. They were all beautiful girls. And, and he didn't give their names or anything, but people who collect the pictures think that they take it. They're getting pictures of us or not. <laughs> Well, it, it actually kills me to say this because we barely scratched the surface, but I'm being given the wrap-up signal. But because um, there's so many more wonderful stories you have, but we yeah. don't have the time. But you did want to plug um, the, your CDs that you have for sale. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I'm plugging. I'm plugging the California Artists Radio Theater. And many of these wonderful actors that I just mentioned are performing on the shows. And we just did the one with Bill, uh, uh, what is his name? The, the star, star Trek star. Shatner. Shatner. Shatner plays the lead in one we just did with Ray Bradbury and Norman Corwin. I had, it's a wonderful story, I wish I could tell you. We don't have time. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh. Thank you. And if, if you if you can't find us, just go to your computer, look up CART, C A R T, California Artists Radio Theater, and it will take you to a website that tells you where to go to purchase anything. And Brian reminds us there are flyers out in the lobby. You can grab one of those. Okay, uh, uh, we now have, uh, I'm sorry? Okay. Yes, I, that was what I was about to do. Okay. <laughs> it's my pleasure to bring the stage a longtime friend of yours, Mr. Jay Munz. Well, it is an honor and a thrill to be able to recognize someone who and over that time, she's amassed an amazing uh, body of work, both stage and screen, but also in the radio, as she's mentioned today, over 8,000 radio productions she's done in her lifetime. But I think one of the things she's most proud of is California Artist Radio Theater. I don't know, did anybody here been able to attend any of these wonderful Marvelous broadcast, and uh, you know, I uh, was born too late to appreciate the heyday of local major radio. But uh, as musical director on, on many of um, Peggy's shows, I got to experience that thrill of working live radio with some of the greatest actors in Hollywood. And I have to tell you that when Peggy would call these people and tell them she was doing a show, they would drop everything to come and be a part of that production. That's how beloved she is in the industry. She is probably one of the last living legends of, of the golden age of radio. Most of her fellow uh, legends are gone now, but I believe they are all smiling down on her today. <laughs> and join me and all of you in congratulating uh, Peggy for achieving this wonderful award, the Cinecom Legacy Award.